Thank you. So I'm going to be talking about the creative brain a little bit. Um, as most of us know, there are many, many forms of creativity. There's dance, there's musical composition, improvisation, creative writing, and creative thought, which of course is tied into creative writing. But I'm going to talk about a specific kind of creative thought, um, especially here at the beginning of, of my talk, called insight. Just as you can see up here, the light bulb going off. We've all experienced this, I think, I hope, a number of times where we have this great sense of relief, this aha moment that we've just discovered something and, oh, that's the correct solution. That must be it. So I would be remiss as a scientist if I didn't work with you and do a short experiment. So I hope you'll grant me that. This is very brief. I want you to take a list, look at this list of words here and try to come up with the construct that binds those three words together. And when you have figured it out, just, just shout it out or raise your hand or, or indicate in some way that you're comfortable with. Apple. How did you feel when you came up with that solution? <laughs> Well, that is the right answer. So, so you converged on, on this solution to this problem, which is novel. Um, we don't normally see this list of words and come up with Apple as the, as the binding construct. That feeling that we have is this aha, this insight, this spontaneous insight that we, we've experienced when we finally arrive at the right solution, either after laborious trial and error or sometimes just after a few seconds. And Thomas Dish, I think, ex expresses this concept pretty well. Creativity is the ability to see relationships where none exist. I would add where none seem to exist. There is a relationship, but sometimes the relationship is so elusive that we can't get at it for quite a while. Creativity can be in the form of spontaneous insight, like we just talked about, um, characterized by, by flashes of insight, or it can be more deliberative and take years, many, many years, for a creative process to unfold. So I'm thinking, um, as, as an example, Eric Kandel, who won the Nobel Prize several years ago for his study of, of memory processes, cell cellular mechanisms of memory. It was a lifelong process for him to come up with these very um, paradigm-shifting understandings of how memory works. Very different from insight, but very creative nonetheless. Creativity can have an emotional component. So we all know the legend of Archimedes, who after discovering that um, water displacement can be used to measure the density of an irregularly shaped object, ran out of the house, allegedly uh, ran out of his community and naked without his clothes, shouting, Eureka, Eureka, I've discovered something. Very emotional, very excited. Um, in all of these cases, creativity is novelty. Inherent in creativity are flexibility, cognitive flexibility and a very highly developed working memory system is very important for your creativity. Creativity is, as I said, novel. It's also useful and must be generative. So this is just a, one experiment that I'm just going to describe to you that, that has measured um, this construct that we call insight. On the left down here is a picture of an MRI machine. And over here is an EEG apparatus. Both of these techniques are used to measure brain activity in one way or another. The MRI machine is used to measure um, where in the brain different constructs might be residing. What parts of the brain do we use to solve problems, for example? Whereas EEG looks at timing information. How quickly do we arrive at a decision? How quickly are we undergoing a, a particular process? And Young Beeman et al. and his colleagues decided to, based on a finding that showed that um, uh, people were faster to pick out a solution word, like in the, test, in the little experiment that you just did, when the word was presented to their right hemisphere as compared to the left hemisphere. They were faster. So he used that finding to design this clever experiment to look at a particular part of the right hemisphere called the right temporal lobe, the front part of the right temporal lobe, to see whether that might be the seat of this insight experience. That part of the brain has been known to be involved in language and particularly in distant relatedness constructs, like the apple example. So here's the pine crab sauce again at the top. This is just one example. There were many like this. So the participants were either inside the scanner or they were doing this EEG um, task. And they were shown the compound words, asked to come up with a solution, and then determine if they had arrived at their solution, if they did arrive at their solution, 
with insight or not. And that was the experiment, the same for both of these. And what these scientists found is this region here, this big yellow blob. This is a picture of the brain in beautiful colors, just so to make it interesting for you to look at. This is the temporal lobe here in green. <laughs> this is the front part, the anterior temporal region of the temporal lobe, where this insight that you all experienced just a few minutes ago, or many of you did, may reside. Now, it's not just here. It's elsewhere in the brain as well. But in these kinds of experiments, there are control conditions to isolate particular processes pretty well. Interestingly, also, this activity seems to have taken place three seconds before the subjects were even aware that they had had this insight, suggesting that there may be some subconscious activity at play. So here we have this area again here. And other areas of the brain that are critical for the creative process are the prefrontal cortices up here. The prefrontal areas are critically important for working memory functions, for executive functions, for higher level attention, attentional control. And it's these processes that are fundamental to the creative process, particularly deliberative creative processes. And one example of a creative process that's actually been studied quite readily, quite um, robustly over the last many years is using a, an experiment called, a task called the alternative uses task, which is simply having, having people um, come up with alternative uses or novel uses for a common household object, say a brick or a newspaper or a paper clip. So if I said, here's a newspaper, tell me as many ways that you can use it that are sort of novel, um, not typical, you might say, I could use it to clean the window, or I could use it to wrap a present, um, things like that. And similarly, for, for a brick, you might use a brick to uh, throw into a window, which I hope you wouldn't do, but a novel use as opposed to building with it. And it turns out that highly creative people show activity, more activity here in this part of the prefrontal area than people who are less creative at this task suggesting that the frontal lobes really are critically important, necessary for this creative process. Probably not sufficient, but definitely necessary. And I need to point out that there are other regions um, that, of course, are involved in the creative process, depending on what kind of creativity is at play. Down here, lost my laser, in blue, is cerebellum. And I've put these arrows up here just to show you that there are very rich connections that exist among all of these brain regions feedback connections. In fact, the cerebellum works very closely with the frontal lobes. The cerebellum, some of you may know, is typically uh, classically thought to be involved in motor processing and motor skills. Well, it turns out that for working memory functions, we need to rehearse and elaborate constantly. And the cerebellum helps to do that, to make elaborations quicker and more efficient. And the temporal lobe, this insight area that we talked about, has rich connections also with the frontal lobe. So the important thing here is that creativity is not in one part of the brain. That would be impossible if every construct were, you know, resided in one particular region, that would be an unwieldy brain that we would all have, right? So it's the connections, it's the network of connections that's really important here. And just um, as an example here, this relational reasoning down here that you see, um, in children it's been shown that this area in the frontal, area, in the frontal cortex, the prefrontal area, is, um, used for even for small, smallish children, out, you know, young school-aged children in spatial reasoning tasks, picking out the right pattern that follows a line of geometric shapes, suggesting that these, the frontal lobes are important for even um, developmental kinds of, kinds of abilities that are, that are dynamic and changing across a child's development. Um, and I wanted to just turn for a minute to what might be happening in a child's development to support creativity. So one cognitive process that is closely tied to the prefrontal cortex that we've just been talking about is fluid reasoning. And in fact, this relational reasoning is an example or a type of fluid reasoning. Cattell, uh, Raymond Cattell first coined this term maybe 40 or so years ago. And he said that fluid reasoning is the capacity to think logically and solve problems in novel situations independent of acquired knowledge. Now, it turns out that, that fluid reasoning develops throughout childhood all the way into adolescence, this skill. 
And similarly, the prefrontal cortex, as many of you probably know as educators, takes time to develop and in fact isn't fully developed until we reach our mid-20s, or early 20s rather. So there, it mirrors the development of this uh, fluid reasoning ability. So it may be that they're tied together in some important way and that fluid reasoning may be a key component to the creative process. I would argue that it is, especially for, for creative thought. But it hasn't been investigated as such um, so thoroughly yet. It's a, it's a very new kind of um, field, I think, and people are starting to do some brain imaging studies to look at the network of regions that might be involved in this construct. And I think in terms of um, sort of evaluating the creative process and looking at uh, the creative process and how it might change across development, it would be very interesting and important and valuable to look at the development of this fluid reasoning skill across childhood and tie it into or possibly correlate it with creative tasks, such as the alternative uses task, the newspaper example, and to see how that might be linked with prefrontal cortex development. And then to evaluate how we might be able to train, to teach children to be more adept at fluid reasoning and to maximize what they have and, and, and to help their development um, and to maximize their efficiency in this construct, which obviously helps them in life um, to be successful human beings. And I think um, the critical and I would say dynamic relationship between development and the educational systems that support it is expressed well by Sir Ken Robinson, who offers this plea. Education is about developing human beings, and human development is not mechanical or linear. It is organic and dynamic. All of us, including those who work in schools, must nurture creativity systematically and not kill it unwittingly. 